Another major consideration in the evolution of pathogen virulence is host range or how many different hosts that pathogen can infect. There is also the issue of spillover virulence that happens with what we call facultative opportunists. That is a case where the virulence has not been evolutionarily adjusted to the human population, for example. And then another issue is that of imperfect vaccines and the evolution of virulence. So first, is, is the pathogen infecting one or is it infecting many host species? The principle here is that a jack of all trades is the master of none. The more host species that are regularly infected, the less well adapted the pathogen will be to any one of them. A pathogen that evolves to be good at exploiting one host loses efficacy in the other hosts. And that is how attenuated live vaccines, in fact, are produced. Serial passage, which is the process used in making attenuated live vaccines, is actually an evolutionary technology. Microbiologists use serial passage to study pathogen virulence and they also use it to produce live attenuated vaccines. It works because pathogens evolve rapidly to specialize on new hosts when that is the only option that they are given. The experimental host is therefore chosen to be genetically uniform and it is not allowed to co-evolve. The results of these processes demonstrate widespread trade-offs in performance on different hosts. And these trade-offs in nature limit host ranges and constrain the emergence of new diseases. So this is what a, a serial transfer experiment might look like. You have a group of genetically homogeneous mice which have never seen this particular pathogen before. One of them is infected, the parasite grows exponentially and is then extracted. It is then used to infect the next host. This process continues each time the parasite is encountering a naive host that is genetically uniform and growing exponentially. So essentially from the parasite's point of view, a serial transfer experiment is exposure to a unlimited environment that is not changing and therefore to which it can adapt very precisely. The pathogens are growing exponentially all the time because the interval between infections is kept fairly short. And they're always going into immunologically naive hosts. So in essence, life is simple and good. Their virulence on the new host then increases and their virulence on their original host, the one that they came from that's not involved in this process, decreases. Here's an example. Here is sal Salmonella tifamurium, it's a bacterium, it's being passaged in mice. And here are the number of mice, that, the percentage of mice, not, not the number, the percentage of mice that die when infected after passages going 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. So 10 passages was enough to get Salmonella very good at killing mice. Here is what went on with the ability of polio virus to kill monkeys where it is being passaged in cell culture, okay? So cell culture is genetically uniform. The monkey is the test host. The longer it's passaged in cell culture, the less able it is to kill monkeys. After 50 passages, it was judged to be attenuated and safe for use. And that in fact is how the Sabine live polio vaccine was originally produced. These are the data from the production of that vaccine. Another interesting piece of virulence biology has to do with spillovers. And a spillover occurs when a pathogen, which is in a natural reservoir and is well adapted to its natural host, encounters a new host and spills over into it. And the issue is, what is then its virulence? It is in that new host, a facultative opportunist. An example is Ebola. Some of the most virulent human diseases are caused by pathogens 
that actually spend most of their time in other hosts. Their impact on humans is mostly irrelevant to their evolution in their natural hosts, which are often bats or rodents. Many of them kill humans too rapidly to transmit effectively. And other zoonotic infections have little impact and pass unnoticed. In fact, we probably are infected many, many more times than we know. Let's take a look at an ecological way of classifying pathogens. Some are obligate parasites, and there are specialists on humans. For example, that would be Plasmodium falciparum, HIV, flu, TB. There are non-specialists, such as Lyme disease, Borrelia burgdorferi, the rabies virus, Salmonella, Bartonella. There are also facultative parasites, things that can either be free-living or parasitic. The specialists on humans are commensal opportunists, such as Staph and Enterococcus faecalis, Haemophilus influenzae, and Strep. And then there are non-specialists that are facultative, and some of these are environmental opportunists, for example, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Burkholderia, also Rhodococcus and Mycobacterium marinum. So, a principle here is that a response to a source is much stronger than a response to a sink. So an obligate parasite is living in a source and responds strongly to it, whereas a facultative parasite might experience a human host as a sink. In other words, it is not a place where it is going to reproduce well or perhaps disperse well from, and over evolutionary time, that means that its interactions with the human are not going to be as finely honed as it would, would be with an obligate parasite. So there are really two principles of pathogen adaptation and of adaptation in general. One is that the significance of effects depends on how frequently a condition is encountered. And the other is the one I've just mentioned, which is that responses to sources are then much stronger than responses to sinks. So there's an analogy here to the evolution of aging. Genes are transmitted more by the young than by the old. Pathogens adapt more to the things that they encounter frequently in and are accustomed to living in than to the things that they spill over into and experience as sinks. Another issue with virulence, and a very important one, is raised by imperfect vaccines. Vaccines are a major human intervention in pathogen evolution. They are one of the biggest, most challenging new developments that pathogens have ever seen. Childhood vaccines, which are a major component of the reduction in infant mortality over the last hundred years, are sterilizing and they protect nearly perfectly. Once vaccinated and once a response to vaccination is produced, then the person vaccinated is going to be disease resistant probably for the entire life. Boosters are needed in some cases, but most of these protect nearly perfectly. Imperfect vaccines are different. They are a threat because they allow transmission. Not everyone who is vaccinated clears the pathogen from their system and can therefore, in some cases, transmit it to another person. They cause increased virulence for two reasons. First, they extend host survival time. That allows more virulent strains to transmit. And second, by reducing the cost of virulence, they shift the balance in the virulence transmission trade-off. So by reducing the cost of virulence, what we mean is that the vaccine is allowing strains to survive and continue to transmit that in an unvaccinated person would have killed that person too quickly. Unvaccinated hosts in this scenario will then experience a nastier disease once the pathogen has evolved in response to a vaccine campaign with an imperfect vaccine. Now, that doesn't mean we shouldn't vaccinate. It is still wise to vaccinate because even an imperfect vaccine will save millions of lives. However, it is useful to know about and to plan for 
the evolutionary consequences of imperfect vaccines. We need contingency plans. Contingency, pla contingency plans for increased virulence if imperfect vaccines are used. So to summarize, when pathogens are forced to specialize on a new single host, their virulence in that host increases and their virulence in their old host decreases. That's the evolutionary basis for producing attenuated live vaccines. Spillover events can have any virulence level at all, high or low. Some are extremely virulent because the pathogens are not yet adapted to humans. That is the case with Ebola, MERS, SARS, rabies, things like that. Imperfect vaccines can drive the evolution of increased virulence and where we are going to need contingency plans for them.